Yo, and welcome into episode two. What season is this, CD? Season three of yeah, pre-gaming three. the SEC. Look at us. Who would have thought? Not me. But we are here. And you're probably like, wait a minute. How does he have so much glee in his voice? We thought we'd turn on this podcast, and we thought because LSU, Florida guy, they'd be singing, Hello, darkness, my old friend. But that is not <laughs> going to be the case. Okay, we are not going to allow that to be the case on this podcast hey, because this is pre-gaming the SEC, not Pastor, pre-gaming Florida LSU. Don't let one loss turn into two, bro. We're moving <laughs> forward. We're looking ahead. We're moving on to week two. But I'll tell you this, though. In, in, obviously, I say we're looking forward, and then we do a, a segment where we look back. But the, um, <laughs> the, the, the best part about my weekend – was that Florida got their egg laid on Thursday. I got a chance to enjoy everybody else laying eggs. South Carolina yes. Saturday, uh, LSU's on Sunday, even out of conference, Clemson looking as bad as they did in the loss to Duke. So uh, I washed away all of those uh, bad emotions from what I, I uh, was feeling on Thursday night. Yeah, misery loves company. That's without question. And look, I was enjoying Florida's misery. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to hate on CD on the podcast coming up this week. It's going to be so much fun. And I should have just waited. That's why you never celebrate too early because LSU had their own ugly loss. And we will get to all of that just like we have every single week to kind of give you a lay of the land. We're going to have a hold my beer. Pretty, you know, self-explanatory there. And it can be like, Hey, you think you did something great? Hold my beer. Oh, you thought that we were bad. (laughs) Well, hold my beer because we can show you how bad we can be. So it can be a couple of different things. Of course, last call is sometimes it's a, it's a last call where we celebrate. Sometimes it's a therapy session. Today might be a therapy session and last call. Very excited for the interview we've got coming up. CNN's Caitlin Collins, who is an Alabama alum. And there's a game in Tuscaloosa this weekend, CD, that I think is uh, a, what they call it in the biz, a needle mover? Yeah, no, it definitely has the excitement level high. And I'm anxious to ask Caitlin whether or not she'll be in attendance. I know she tries to get down to Tuscaloosa uh, a couple times a year for some games and and uh, definitely is very passionate about her tide. So we'll we'll ask her about that too and the overall scope of the SEC. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. She's got her focus on much bigger and more important things worldwide and, and here within our country, but – uh, I know she'll have an eye on the uh, the game this weekend in Tuscaloosa for sure. All right, so let's get into our first segment, the way we start every episode of the podcast out, and that is with Hold My Beer. And I will start this out. My beer is being grabbed and passed to Jalen Milrow because, well, he kind of grabbed it himself. What a performance it was by him. I'm not even, I'm not going to get into stats. I could sit here and I could give you the stat line. That's not what it was about. He said, hold my beer, because he went and took the quarterback job at Alabama, the biggest question mark in college football in this offseason. And if a quarterback never showed himself to be the leader in the clubhouse in that battle, I always thought that Jalen Milrow was the guy for the job because you knew he had a unique skill set. You knew that he could do some things with his legs and enough with his arm to be able to go out there and do what he did against Middle Tennessee State. Now, the competition is going to go way up. I do understand that this week, but they just needed something, CD. They needed a jolt from that position because nobody, again, nobody went and won that job. They go get Tyler Buckner after spring practice. He was always sitting there. He played last year. He was the guy that came in when Bryce Young got hurt. And I always felt like, well, you know what? It might not have the level of a Bryce Young because Bryce Young is generational. He might be the best quarterback to ever play at your school. And I know that's saying something, but it might be true. We talked about it last week. And so you had a different standard. But sometimes the standard is the old Bill Belichick, keep it simple, stupid. And it's the KISS method. And that's what they did. They went back to some of the old school Alabama principles, and they shined. And now they've got an opportunity. If they go out there on Saturday night in front of the entire country and shine against a talented Texas team, then the question that we asked all offseason long, the reason why I was not as high on Alabama, you were not as high on Alabama because nobody won that job. Well, at the end of the day, maybe they were doing too much, and Jalen Milrow was the answer right there in front of them. Let me ask you a question. You know Coach Saban very, very well. You know how much I, I love being around Coach Saban when I'm with you. I get the you know, I get the the love by association, and so it's always fun to to kind of listen to him talk more candidly when you're around. But 
Do you think that he was playing coy at all in the offseason? Was some of the 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 talk about, hey, we just want one guy to go, you know, take the job yeah. and run with it. Let, let me make it a prove to me that that I need to make an announcement about this and that the 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 lack of any clarity kind of led us to believe that nobody had really excelled. But watching the way that the offense played and the confidence that he had and the growth from where I thought he was a great athlete last year to a guy that played the quarterback position very well this year has me confused about what actually went on in the preseason. It's a great question because you're wondering, okay, did he know this all along? Was he just trying to create this narrative in the media? I don't think so because they went and got Tyler Butner. If they didn't do that, then absolutely. I'd be like, he knew what he had all along, but he wanted to create this question mark and, and this doubt around the country. Could Alabama be the team we've always known them to be? But you go and get Tyler Buckner, and that changed things for me. So maybe to some extent, but not fully, because I still think they had a big question after spring practice, and they tried to get it answered by going to get Tyler Buckner, and then he just didn't go win the job. Interestingly enough, Tyler Buckner is the second quarterback to come in the ball game against Middle Tennessee last Saturday. Yeah, uh, Ty Simpson comes in third. Do you think that Jalen Milrow won the job because Ty Simpson was not up for the competition that he took a step backwards yeah. from where they expected? Because I, I certainly didn't believe that Tyler, yeah, uh, that the Tyler Buckner was going to be the the backup quarterback. I thought he would be your number three. Well, there's only a couple of ways that you can go when a competition is happening. You can either go to the top and win the job or you're not going to be able to handle it and you go backwards. That's just the way it's always been for me in competition. And you and I did a three-hour radio show earlier today, and we talked about competition. We were talking about the Senior Bowl. We were talking about that being a great week because the cream truly rises to the top. Yep. And when you have a competition like that, even if you have a skill set that's better than others, sometimes that skill set doesn't show itself because it, it becomes too much. It consumes you, and you think about it too much. I don't know that that happened. In Tuscaloosa, but to your point, I expected to see Ty Simpson second in the game because Tyler Buckner doesn't have all this experience. A lot of people throw that out there. He, he had a handful of games at Notre Dame, yeah. so it's not like, well, you know, he's a senior guy. He's a veteran guy. We'll give him a bone. We know that maybe the ceiling's not as high, but we can trust him. He's only played a handful of games. And but he so, has been around Tommy Reese and been in that offense, you know, so he, he understands well, but, that. But the offense is Saban's offense. It's not Ty, It's not Reese's offense. Yeah. Right? I mean, when you become offense coordinator at Notre Dame, you learn their offense. Yeah. They don't learn yours. I mean, that's been the last couple of coordinators. So that advantage that a lot of us thought he had, if you know how they run things at Alabama, you that's realize, true. yeah, no, Tommy Reese's offense is now Nick Saban's offense because you have to learn what he does. It's a good point. I think, you know, going back to your your uh, comment about Milrow, it was the most talked about subject in the offseason. Yeah. Who would win the Alabama job? Um, would it be uh, somebody that was able to live up to half of what Bryce Young's done the last couple of years? I think at least through week one. And, and after week one, there are a lot of people that overreact and try to project based upon a small sample size. But th I, I'm seriously rethinking what I think Alabama can be this year, not only because of Jalen Milrow, but that offensive line played better. Uh, the receivers made plays down the field, more yeah. explosive plays than we had seen. So I, I have reason to be more optimistic about the tide. Uh, and that's not even talking about what we saw on the defensive side where you know, they struggled creating turnovers last year. And they, they, they were able to do some of that on Saturday night as well. Yeah. Competition goes way up. We've talked about it. Texas, very talented. Talent only gets you so far. A lot of people have said that about Texas in the past. I think this is a different Texas team. I think they have a different feel to them, and it's a great opportunity for them. But if Jalen Milrow does what he did against that team that he did last week, then we're talking about, okay, hey, Bama, we were wrong again. You are truly still in that conversation of being a true championship contender. And we're talking national championships, not SEC championships. And so that is my hold the beer CD. Where are you passing yours out to? Yeah, you're a very positive guy. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I love uh -oh. the fact that you're focusing on something good. I'm a former wide receiver. There yeah. were a ton of great catches throughout college football in the first weekend of the season. A lot of great performances by wide receiver crews. Uh, we we got the the ball game going on Sunday night, and you look up at the half. LSU's up 17-14, yep. largely because of some self inflicted wounds from Florida State. Six penalties for 58 yards. LSU wasn't penalized in the first 30 minutes at all. Yep. Um, certainly, you know, the, the, L the FSU defense kept them in the game, limiting some of the points that were scored down in the red zone.
but FSU was shooting themselves in the foot because they couldn't catch the football. And it was driving me crazy. And you know what we saw at halftime? LSU collectively as a group of receivers said, hey, hold my beer. You thought those drops were bad? Watch me out drop you. And that's exactly yeah. what they did in the second half. Kyra Lacey drops a, a, a crucial third down that, that could have kept the drive alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr. wide open down the field. I understand, you know, that there's some 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 color that flashes in front of you with a defensive back, but the ball was not tipped. You work on distraction drills every single day in practice. You got to catch the football. And to me, that was the turning point of the ball game. When he didn't make that play, they're down seven points. Uh, an opportunity to be inside the red zone if you're able to to pull it in. Uh, that didn't happen. And it, Malik Davis, he didn't drop any balls, but I didn't think he played yeah. particularly well. There was seriously a, a disconnect between Jane yeah. Daniels and Malik Neighbors. Malik Neighbors falls down and the ball gets intercepted. You cannot do that. You got to stay over your cleats, regardless of how slippery the field is. Every wide receiver coach will tell you that. So, you know, as, as much as I talked about the wide receiving core for LSU being something that I was excited about this year, they let me down. They outdropped a team that dropped a yeah. lot of passes in the first half in FSU. Yeah, I'll quickly back you up there. It is something where you have to make those plays. You have to, on third down, the money down, you've got to make that play for your quarterback. The offensive line, go back and watch that clip. The third and eight that you're talking about where Lacey drops the pass, the offensive line gave Jaden Daniels all day. They gave him a great pocket. He stands tall in the pocket, delivers a pass, hits you in stride, in your hands, and you drop that ball. That is a potential game-changing moment. Did Florida State take from that moment on and dominate the rest of the game? They did. Credit to Florida State. But in those moments... Was it? I think it was the last play of the third quarter for Brian Thomas down the sideline. Man, you talk about getting some juice going into the fourth quarter. And yeah, you you certainly had a defensive back that found his way back into the play because the quarterback didn't give you probably enough air on the ball, but it was still a very catchable ball, and you don't make that play. And I'm as shocked as you about Malik Neighbors and Jaden Daniels not being on the same page. They last year, Malik Neighbors, 1,000-yard receiver, Right, Jaden Daniels found him to be the favorite target after they stopped trying to force the ball to Kayshawn Booty. We didn't see that in Sunday night in Orlando. We saw two guys not on the same page, at least in my opinion, four times. They've got to get that cleaned up, CD. You know that you had a great relationship with your quarterbacks at Florida. You can be great. Your quarterback can be great. But if y'all aren't on the same page, that doesn't matter. No, that's a great point. And it's something that I think we were all surprised by given the amount of snaps that they played together last year. All three of those guys were catching balls for, for Jaden Daniels last season, the amount of time that you go through the off season while you're working together. The fact you got a, a a holdover offensive coordinator, like so many other teams making changes at the offensive coordinator position. You're one of the few that has the quarterback offensive coordinator combo back for another year. Really surprised by that. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about LSU later on, but really surprised that they didn't have more productivity down in the red yeah. zone, and uh, that was ultimately one of the things that cost them. Yeah, no excuses to not score from the one-yard line. I wasn't very good at many things, but one thing I knew I was going to do was score from the one-yard line. You have to have a mentality. You have to say, you know what, I don't, I don't care. I don't care what you line up in. Formation be damned. I don't care if it's block perfect, whatever it is. I am going to put my full body in this end zone because it's one yard. It is a mentality at that point. Let an unblocked linebacker be in the A-gap. I don't care. I don't give a damn. I'm going to find my way to go through that A-gap linebacker and score. And so, yeah, that is something that, again, game-changing moment in that game for LSU that they were not able to get done. Um, and one quick last note, kind of what you're talking about. In the first series, we saw Aaron Anderson line up at receiver, a lot of motion, a lot of window dressing, and, man, LSU going right down the field. Two plays are already, uh, you know, in goal-to-go situation. Aaron Anderson played six plays of offense. Where did he go? So there's questions all over the place for LSU that we certainly have not yet gotten answered, and they've got an opportunity to have a big bounce-back week against Grambling because it is a game you had a year ago against Southern. You have it now against Grambling, and you've got to get those things Fix. Before we go to last call here on pre-gaming the SEC, we want to tell you about our good friends over at Blue Delta Jeans, bluedeltajeans.com. Man, they have so much available. I mean, you could go check it out right there. The Traveler Performance Pan is on the homepage of the website. You know what they can do in the jean game. I mean, the Ryder Cup team, 
they're going to all be rocking those blue Delta jeans. They're doing big things, not only in the SEC footprint. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, you know all about blue Delta jean because you can't go to an SEC canvas and not see a thousand pairs walking around the tailgate. But go get your pair today because as we told you last week, nothing feels as good as custom fits and blue Delta jeans.com is the place to go. All right, let's go to our next segment. It is last call. It's where we stop complaining a lot of times. Sometimes if it's like in a celebratory mood, like we'll maybe hang on to a win a little bit too long, but I don't know that we have that this week. We've actually got a vibe check to go around the room. We're going to bring in Big Turp in this as well. And CD, I'll let you lead this. Vibe check around the room, panic meter, where should it be? And you've got a couple of teams you want to lay out. Yeah, I mean, I think there were three very um, visible teams that that were playing in big ball games that all three of them failed i mean like i actually think we need to have a vibe check not only for the schools that lost but for the conference as a whole i mean you, you had a matchup with the acc in three ball yeah. games you finish one and two there like typically we never lose a series with an out-of-conference uh opponent when we're having multiple games in football um that that acc sec challenge usually happens at the the end of the season and rivalry week but we got an early yeah. season look at it and it's important for a couple of reasons one you know the pride of the conference is is big time nobody chants the, the conference's initials like we do the sec sec but it also has to do with the perception of teams within that conference later in the season when we get to the college football playoff yeah. rankings it matters how you do out of conference and you know, for you, uh, for Florida losing to Utah, for South Carolina using losing to North Carolina, for LSU losing to Florida State, those were big time visible games that uh, largely the three schools didn't even play very well. So not only do you lose in 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 three of those games, but you lose in a manner that's embarrassing to you as a program and to the conference as yeah. a whole. I don't think there's any question. I mean, Tennessee took care of UVA. UVA is not a great team. UVA is going to be one of the worst power five programs at the end of the year. They have a long way to go there. Tennessee took care of business though. The other teams, not only did they not take care of business, they got beat up. They got bullied. Now South Carolina really kind of for the full game on the offensive line, LSU in the second half. And that's not what we're used to seeing from those programs. And we knew South Carolina's offensive line was going to be a struggle. Cole Kublik told us that at sec media days but not to that extent. North Carolina was a bad defense. We love our guy, Gene Chizik. I think he was the first guest we ever had here on pregaming the SEC. We love Chiz. And he made major improvements. But you can't get dominated that way because now you've showed a blueprint on how you're going to get dominated. And for LSU, fight until the clock hits triple zero. That's what you want to see. Fight until the clock hits triple zero. Because was the game out of hand? Yeah. Yeah, you knew. You knew when the fourth quarter started. Doesn't matter. You made a epic comeback against that same team last year. It was 17 to three. And you're like, oh, this is over until it wasn't. So those are some of the things that were surprised to me, CD, as we get to last call. Yeah, I think as as we relate to uh, go back to to Florida, um, I I can I can excuse you know a third and short, fourth and short jumping offside situation in the first game of the season in a hostile, loud environment mm -hmm. like the game was being played. I cannot excuse receivers not understanding that you have to line up on the line of scrimmage looking down yeah. inside knowing that somebody has to cover up you know the 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 tackle at the end of the line not having enough people uh for get that procedure penalty multiple times is unacceptable having two number threes on the field at the same time is unacceptable that is completely on the coaching staff there the fact that you can't get plays in on time that you're going deep into the play clock over and over again yeah. to the point where you get a delay a game penalty in the red zone that is not acceptable. So no. there are some serious questions that have to be asked. And I'm, you know, I, I'm a big Billy Napier fan. I, I felt good about the direction of the program, but even the most staunch defenders of Billy Napier, and I'm surprised that I have to say that, you know, 14 games into his tenure yeah. here, but even the most staunch defenders have to have questions about how they can look like they were in such disarray after yeah. you've been working the entire off season to be ready for this game. D.D., you know how I feel about Billy Napier. As soon as he got the job at Florida, I reached out to you immediately, yeah. but I have to throw some shade his way and not for where they're at after year one and one game in year two. The The number threes on the field at the same yeah. time, I don't know that I've ever been so mad 
at like a like a non play failure, like yeah. not something that happened between the whistles. That can never ever happen for a couple of reasons. One, like why do we have double digit numbers? Like same guys wearing you know same duplicate numbers. I should say. Why do we have that? Like yeah. what, what, like. Wait a minute. When did what? that when did that rule change? Like uh, when you and I played, they didn't have. Or I don't, at least I, when I honestly, played. I I don't even know. I'm not even sure. But why do we have it? I, actually, yeah. it was in play when I was playing. Okay, but I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a couple of, of of hits here. Like it can't happen because everybody wants to wear a single digit. I get it. It's cool. Look at me. It's like the old Coastal Carolina coach. Look at me. I'm in the mirror, looking in my bands, and got my bands on, and <laughs> want to be a dog. That whole deal. Okay, I get that. We need dogs. But what, like, come on, man, not to keep me off the field. When I was getting recruited by LSU, before they offered me number 18, I wore number 13. Shout out Dan the Man Marino. Corey Webster, also All-American, wore number 13. He played DB. I played running back. But there was a slight chance that maybe somehow we'd be on the field at the same time. We'll punt return, maybe kick off, something like that. And Coach Dahl said, hey, here's the situation. This could happen. It could keep you off the field. I said, oh, the hell with that. I'll find another number. 13 meant a lot to me at the time. And again, before I got off for number 18, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I am not going to miss a play because I want to look good in number 13. I don't know the situation at Florida, but that just, that irked me so bad. And look, your name's Trey. You want to wear, you're the third. You want to wear three. I get it. But that can never happen. That led to a touchdown by Utah. It might have cost you the game. You have 70 people in blue polos in your team picture, and not one of them noticed that you have two number threes on the field. We're, we're not and, talking about interior guys either. We're talking about a return guy and a guy that's uh, covering the gunner on the outside. Like you know, Those are two visible yes. players. And, and also, don't put this on the equipment staff. Oh, they were supposed to have a 33 jersey ready to go. No, when you line up in the dots getting ready for special teams that everybody has, you count to 11. Make sure you got 11 guys out there. Blue Polo, you're supposed to notice that. That's not on the equipment staff, right? You tell them who to put the jersey on. That can never happen at any level of this kind of football. SEC football, Pac-12 football, group of five, FCS, whatever. That can never happen. That potentially, don't know it to be factual, but you got them off the field. You're getting the ball back. Who knows? You let them score a touchdown off that, man. It fired me up so much that that's the reason that they scored a touchdown. You can say, well, the defense could have stopped them. They could have, but you don't they think they did. were tired? They already did. They stopped <laughs> you don't think them. they were tired they at al altitude up there in Salt Lake City? They got to go right back on the field? Yeah. Yep. And that was on the heels of a failure down in the red zone where the offense wasn't able to, to get points. Yeah, you know, you so got my blood pressure up here, CD. Well, to, there's one it's one thing to lose when you play a better opponent. And I certainly believe that Utah is in better shape right now than where Florida yes, program they is. Are. The better team won that game. But when you're not as good as the other team and you're playing on the road, you do not have the ability to make mistake after mistake. And you certainly can't make mistakes in crucial situations, third downs fourth downs, yeah. red zones, you know, punts, uh, punt return. Like you, you can't yeah. do that. And to see Florida do that the way they did after thinking, yeah, you know, I said in, in, in Nashville, when we were there, I was asked whether or not Florida wins over or under five and a half games. I said under, I thought they won five games given that they're where they were mm -hmm. and what the schedule they faced. And then after hearing more and, and going out to practice, I think you ever, you, you ever take a, I took a class called theater appreciation in, uh, in college. All right. And one of the things they talk about when you go to the theater is you have to be willing to suspend your disbelief. Mm -hmm. All right. So when it came to, to, to Florida, you know, I think I do a good job of separating, you know, an analyst from being a, a fan and an alum, yeah. but my willingness to want to believe took over. <laughs> and I didn't suspend that willingness to believe the way yeah. that I should. Yeah. And I, I, I started to believe, well, maybe they're catching Utah at a good time with Cam Rising going to be out and, you know, the other players out. Maybe, maybe they're going to catch Tennessee at a good time with Joe Milton just starting, you know, in, in his first, you know, big hostile environment when he comes to the swamp, man, I, I, Again, too early to maybe overreact, but I, I think I was probably more right when I said yeah. five wins, unfortunately, than I was when I thought that maybe they could win six or seven. You had a little bit of what we all get, right? You get a little bit of training camp, utopic feeling, like a, a little utopia, like endorphins kind of start to go one way or the other. And you're like, oh, maybe so. 
and we all it, look it happens to all of us and i saw it happen with you last week and i'm sitting there and i'm like oh man I, maybe he did maybe he saw it i mean i look i've had it with lsu before as well but um it's going to be a long a long road for the florida gators they have every opportunity because they play in the sec to have some major wins but they're gonna to have to write the ship so let, let's do this okay this was your segment, but I'll quickly throw it to you and Big Terp, and I'll answer. Panic level for Florida. We'll start with you, CD. Panic level for Florida, scale of 1 to 10? 1 to 10. Um, I would say 7 with the factors keeping it from being okay. an 8 or a 9 or a 10, being that I saw more playmakers around the quarterback position than I did last year. I thought Graham Mertz did some nice things. Mm -hmm. um, I... I Hopeful that they can shore up the offensive line a little bit. I'm hopeful that they can run the ball a little bit better. I know the talent that they have back there with Etienne and Johnson. Um, I was impressed with the defense. They do give up a 70 yard, you know, touchdown on the first play of, of the game or first offensive snap for Utah, but that yeah. was one player's failure. That's a safety in Moten that's typically playing down in the box. If you go back and watch his career at, at Michigan, he was more of a, a box safety than he was a, yeah. a center field safety. He rotates back to the middle gets caught looking at the over route instead of understanding that he's got inside help on the, the, the yeah. post route. Um, and then Florida turns the ball over inside the 20 early in the third quarter where the pass drops off, you know, bounces off Ricky Pearsall's chest and you yeah. know, creates a short field situation for Utah's offense. Other than that, I, I thought, I thought, you know, the defense played pretty well and, and did a lot of what you asked at least in the second half to keep you in the ball game, wait for your offense to show up. All right. So it was seven there. Uh, I'll go a seven as well. The only reason I don't go an eight because my expectation for them in that game was to have some failures because of what I believed of Utah to be. And Utah down as many starters as they were. Those guys came in and they really did a nice job. I mean, that's a veteran football team. That is a football team that's as well coached as any team in the country. And it showed in Salt Lake City on Thursday of last week. And so I'll kind of stay with you at seven. And if they don't find a way to run the football, it's going to go from – a seven to maybe an eight or a nine. They have got to get the run established and their defensive line has to be able to make more plays in space. And so for me, I'll stay at a seven right now. I'll throw it to big Terp. big Terp. your panic level right now with the Florida Gators. Well, so when you first posted, that, I was going to say seven, I won't be that guy. I'm not going to triple down on seven, <laughs> which makes me say, do I think it's closer to a six or an eight? And I think I do go eight, unfortunately. Yeah. And I, I mean, CD, you, you had me going. I bought in. I, I was feeling good about the Gators. I might have even dabbled on the Now mic. I'm the bad guy. No, no, yes. no. Yes. No, no, you're just living yes. in good preseason utopia. But yep. now we're back where we were. When Graham Mertz first came over, it was largely, meh. It's Graham yeah. Mertz. We've seen him. He's average. Don't blame Graham Mertz. This wasn't Graham Mertz's fault. Like, no. Graham Mertz did a good job of being at the line of scrimmage. The first play of the game gets him out of a, a run play, gets him into a pass that gains eight yards. Now you're scored 11 of points, though, CD. That's, I'm, yeah. Even if they clean up all of the penalties and all of the bad – He didn't like, jump off sides. He didn't line up <laughs> No, off. no, no. No, but even if they <laughs> clean everything up, I just don't see that offense having enough firepower to get past that five or six win mark, which – if you're Florida, to me, that makes you an eight on the panic level. You know what's hard for me, guys, and, and not to go off script too much here, but like watching other teams across the country throw the football with such effectiveness, watching with them such score, ease. watching Colorado, a group of yeah. players that hadn't been together for more than six months or so. Like yeah. the fact that they could go out there and execute at that level is pretty amazing. And you know, to have an offense that's kind of struggled on and off the way it has the last couple of years at my, my alma mater, it's frustrating. But I also yeah. go back to think about how hard it is to find a quarterback and to get a quarterback to play at a high level. Because think about it. There's a lot of great prospects. Some of the great prospects are overrated. Some of them are properly rated and they come in and maybe they're not in the right system or maybe they're not developed the right way or maybe they don't have the right play caller or maybe mm -hmm. they don't have great receivers. But to be able to hit on a quarterback, to have somebody come in and and live up to the hype and play at the highest level and 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 have a Joe Burrow type season is rare. Like it is it is so unbelievably lucky when your school is able to get all of that to happen and have it come to fruition with realized success on the field. 
Yeah, and now you got to do it more so than ever because a lot of times you're finding that guy. I mean, we could go across the board and we could pick out situations that recruited, developed, and kind of he was their guy to start with, signed with them out of high school, and now he's been their guy. Like It's almost like you feel like you can count those guys on one hand now because yep. of the situation that we're talking about like it's going like connor wegman at, at a&m he's not the norm anymore yeah right Jalen milrow could be a guy at alabama he could be could turn but out like, to be that and you, when you go to lsu you go to Ole miss you go to florida i mean you could go across the board like it's starting to be less and less and so you have to be able to adapt to that and much quicker than when you and i were playing it's like you got to transfer and it's like one it was unique and two it's like how long is it going to take you to integrate yourself into the team now you got to do it almost immediately all right that was your therapy session for the florida gators i hope you feel better about it quickly here for lsu i think a lot of what happened on sunday in orlando yeah they certainly have some blame when you play quarter quarter halves you know what you have to play cd quarter quarter halves you can't just go out there and play your own coverage you had guys floating in zone coverage and you can't do that yeah. Zone coverage, you have a responsibility, and you watched the tape, and it was all over the place. And when it was man coverage, there's one time on a fourth and two, it's man across the board. Harold Perkins has the back one on one. The offense is left, the defense is right. While the running back goes across the formation, Harold Perkins looks at him, thinks about it, and then takes off. It's too late. Yeah. Running back catches it in the flats across the formation. He gets down all the way to the two yard line, time and time again. That was a story for LSU on the on the defense side of the let, football. Let me, let me ask you a question then. I, I hate to interrupt you, but like one of the most talked about topics after that game on Sunday was is Harold Perkins in the wrong position? Like it, you know, that was one of the things that yeah. I thought was strange in the offseason, like taking a guy that was that impactful doing what he did last year and turning him into something else. I thought, well, maybe they know something I don't know. And listening to Takeo Spikes talk about you know, how you can rush the passer you from can. the inside linebacker position I said the same better. Things. Yeah. So, but in, in one of the most important things for any athlete, particularly somebody that has the athletic ability that Harold Perkins does is being able to not think and just play. Yeah. Just putting him in that position. You right. talked about the guy going across the formation, thought about it by the time he got going, he's a step late. He's beat to the flat. Do you think they made a mistake one game in? You have the right, right. to overreact. Is it yeah. a mistake to have him playing where he is? Not necessarily where he's playing, but how you use him. And some of this has to fall in Harold Perkins' lap. Like, he's got to take ownership of not being in the right spot. Because regardless of if you're rushing or not, you got to still play the zone. You have that man in coverage. You have to do that. So I don't want to hand wave that away. But he's obviously better when it's see ball, get ball. Yeah. And that that is where he thrives. But team started to go away from him and game plan away from him. A&M did a masterclass job last year when they didn't do that against anybody else. They had a hell of a game plan for Harold Perkins and they went away from him for LSU. They just, they have to not be predictable and you've got to allow him to have those moments, man. You have to have those moments where you go out there and you just release him. Like we saw so many teams last year. So my final last call here on LSU. Hold up. We didn't give the number. Oh, uh, yeah. Did you give the I'm number? A, no, I'm okay. about to. I'm about All to. Right. My final last call for LSU, I'll stay at a five. And some of that has to do with Florida State. And I, I really think they're a top three football team right yeah. now. So who they played, the moments they had in that game, had a lead at the, at the half, didn't take advantage of it. We saw this last year. And so if we didn't see it last year and you had a different opponent, I think I'd be at a seven or an eight. But I think I'll stay right now at a five for LSU because they have a game where they can get back on track this week before they head to Mississippi State. Well, that's a great point. You know, the for teams like South Carolina, for Florida, even for LSU, you can point to the fact that, hey, you were awful in week one and yeah. you were able to make some strides and, and turn your season into something that looked like it could be a disaster yeah. into a Western Division championship. So um, I'm, I'm probably about a six because I still believe in LSU. I, I believe in Jaden Daniels. I believe in this receiving core, but they got to play a lot yeah. better. And, um, I honestly, uh, have reevaluated a little bit. It's easy to overreact through week one, but my LSU pick to win the West is not looking as good given the way that they played and subsequently how Alabama looked in week one.
Hey, they have the ability to do what they did last year, lose game one and still win the West. And oof, we'll see if they can get it done. Big Terp quickly panic rating on LSU. I'm even going to come in at the lowest. I'm going four. And I mean, yeah. a lot of it's what you said. It's because we've seen this last year. But mm -hmm. you pointed to the fact that you get Grambling. You get Grambling, you go to Starkville, and then you host Arkansas. Yeah. Yet, and I'm not, I'm not not throwing away at Mississippi State and hosting Arkansas as easy games, but you get those three winnable games before you go to Oxford. You get Mason Smith back. And then yeah. just for me, the biggest thing is it does take a lot of mental gymnastics to say a 45-24 loss is a winnable game if you fix certain things. Right. But Florida State did look national championship good, and they should have hung with them the entire game. So, I mean, it's stuff you can clean up. You get Mason Smith back, and there's a reasonable schedule going ahead. So, I'm, I'm coming for. Hey, real quick. I don't I, – I, you know, we mentioned South Carolina. We don't have time to dive deep in them. Let's just go around the table numbers in terms of our uh, panic concern. Uh, six because we've seen so many ebbs and flows, peaks and valleys from that team. I still think it's at a six. Next week, ask me again. I'll have a, probably a different number for you. What team last year did like this more than South Carolina? Yeah, That's but why what I team can't... has a serious liability in their offensive they do. line the way they, they, do. they do? There ain't now, no, there's no free agency. There's no trades being made right now. You but, are what you are on the line. Yeah, you are. As far as a nine sack offensive line that but you gave now up. That, now that you know you are, you got to come up with every quick game you can imagine, every tight end chip, every back chip that you possibly can. Am I biased towards Shane Beamer? Probably so, but a I'm six with, with a chance to be a 10 quickly. Hey, the injury factor. I mean, how yeah. have you ever seen so many injuries at the beginning of a season, though? You know, we don't know Juice Wells' status. Mo Cava's out for the year again. I feel terribly for that kid. Yeah. Uh, you lose your tackle. Um, Nick Emignori, it, it was out, you know, so there's a lot of guys that we don't even know the status of outside of the offensive line. So there, it, I'm, I'm worried. I'm, I'm labeling that at an eight and that's me kind of being conservative right there. And that's fair real quick, big turp. I'm going nine. That's, I mean, okay. to me, they were one of the teams coming in where if you told me they were going to be an eight win team, I'd believe you. If you told me they'd yeah. be a five win team i'd believe you but that week one was so freaking important it was north carolina had 17 sacks last year mm -hmm. the whole year and they had more than half of that on sat on sunday saturday friday wh Who whatever cares? whatever Shout out, cheers. good job yeah, i say they got cheers they got cheers that's that pre game with the sec effect like you said there's first, no question. first guest there's no question. All was right. he our first guest on the show? Yeah, I think he was our first guest. I'm pretty yep. sure he was. You think we could get him back this week or maybe sometime? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's up to you. I mean, you've got yeah. that connect better than we do. Hey, Coach, why not? I mean, hey, you're putting the game plan together. You can come hang out with the fellas. Yeah, get that done, CD. I'll put that on you. All right, we are very excited. This is Episode 2, Season 3, and this is our first guest we have coming up this year, and it is a big one. It is an Alabama native. It is an Alabama graduate. It is CNN's own Caitlin Collins, who is coming up right here on Pre-Gaming the SEC. Caitlin, welcome in to Pre-Gaming the SEC. We are very happy to have you here. We appreciate you making time for us today. Of course. Thank you for having me. The, the response, by the way, I think if we'd have talked anything else and asked her to do it with us would have been much different. But when I mentioned talking yeah. a little Alabama, Texas to her, I got I, I you got back quickly. And I guess that's just indicative of the passion that you have for this uh, football team and the program in general. I feel like I responded in like 0. 0.3 seconds or something like that. Um, actually, oh. this is in my office right now. Someone gave me this for my birthday last year. <laughs> um, <laughs> saving. Yeah, Will that see, be burning I, this weekend? Well, I felt like I've had Hopefully to burn not. that a couple of times when I was playing for him, like just saying <laughs> a couple of prayers. So I understand that. Yeah, he'll stay on you. We got to watch him um, when I was down uh, in Tuscaloosa a few weeks ago. We were watching them practice at the facility, and it was just – he was like kind of smiling, which was like freaking me out, um, especially at practice. But uh, but it was great to see them getting did, ready for the Did season. you see the story in AL.com about the number of times he smiled in years past at press conferences and what that's correlated to success throughout the season? Is it like three times, or what is it? Uh, I think – supposedly you know uh it, it, it may not be any real determination but i i think after watching the first game of the season i mean i asked this to hester the other day did he ever play coy because i feel like all the, the press conferences leading up to the season was like oh no quarterbacks taking the ball and run with it i want somebody to just do it and then they roll out this team that looks as complete as any team in the country in week one i mean what, what were your expectations heading into the season versus what you saw on saturday against middle 
Okay, so I agree with you um, on the sense of like, who's the quarterback going to be? And when we were down there, it was the week before Middle Tennessee, and they were like, we still don't have a quarterback yet. And clearly, I mean, Jalen Milrow was amazing. And then, but if you listen to Nick Saban at the press conference after when they basically were asking like, you know, what does this mean for how he's going to do, how he's going to play against Texas? Saban like pointed out one of the errors that he made during the game. Like it was like something small he did early on, but like not like the three touchdowns or the yeah. two rushing touchdowns. Like he was yeah. talking about that one small thing. Um, but Jalen Miller, I thought looked amazing. It was so exciting to watch him play like that. And I was looking into him. I didn't realize. So his parents were both military. His dad was a Marine yeah. and his mom was in the Navy. And apparently like that's kind of the thinking of why he has such a good work ethic is that he like kind of grew up with that kind of lifestyle. All right, so I've got to ask you this, because you do live TV, and CD and I do TV, do radio, the whole deal, and there's like an electricity you get whenever the red light comes on and you're about to go on air. What's more nerve-wracking, though, like about to do that or watching an Alabama football game with you? Um, Watching a game. I also curse way more during like a football <laughs> game. I try not to curse on TV um, in case like my grandmother is watching. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know. I don't really know if I get nervous necessarily because I can control what I'm doing on TV for the most part. But like when right. you're watching a game, like I feel like I'm playing, but I'm not involved in any way, shape or form for good reason. And um, I get very stressed. I I'm not someone who's like fun to watch the games with. Like I have a lot of non-football friends who are like, I really want to go to a game right. with you. I'm like, I really I don't know if you do actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't so know if you need to see that side of me, but. CD and I talk about that all the time. I'm way more nervous now watching football yeah. because I can't control it. I cannot affect yeah. the outcome of it. Like when I was playing, I had to say so. And, and now I'm a nervous wreck way more than I ever was being out there on the field. Yeah, I know. It's really, um, we were watching, we went to the U S open last Saturday and then we were like scrambling to get out of there to make to kick off. And it was just like during the U S open, I was like, Oh, this is fine. Like I'm really enjoying this. But like during the Bama games, I'm like, I need to be seated right here full focus on this, no one talking, you know, like just chit chatting. Like I cannot have a conversation with you. That's not about what is happening on the screen right now. Yeah. Well, I'll say this though. I think when we get done playing, you're looking for an outlet that gets your heart pumping the same way that playing did. Yeah. And, and for me being on live television is one of those things. One of the other things is interviewing coach Saban and, and Hester knows this, like I love being with Hester because Hester's one of Coach Saban's favorite players. And so by proxy, I, you know, I get a little more love when I'm with him. But <laughs> we had him on this morning and I'm nervous all night long. I'm thinking about what I'm going to ask him. Like, is there is there an intimidation factor at all when you talk to Coach Saban? And what would the equivalent be in terms of people that you've interviewed that you have a level of anxiousness about before you talk to him? Well, first off, uh, congrats to you because he won't do an interview with me, even though I really, really want to interview him. Um, for obvious reasons, I think that they try to stay all, like out of the political realm uh, because of recruiting, mm -hmm. which is so, yeah. so so Saban esque that it makes me laugh. Um, so I would be so nervous covering him. I mean, I people always tell me like you should cover sports because yeah, obviously I like reporting, I love football, and but I'm like I would be way too biased because I would never write anything critical about him or the program probably uh, in my lifetime. Um, so I actually don't know how I would do if I was in that that briefing room. But um, I'm kind of the same way if I'm if I'm preparing for something that makes me not necessarily nervous, but like I like to be really prepared and I don't ever want to be caught off guard yeah. in an interview. I just prepare like crazy and I'll watch every I watch a lot of tape. I watch like any interviews yeah. that that politician has done. Um, I'm trying a lot of it lately has been like 2024 hopefuls. Vivek Ramaswamy is someone that. I'd interviewed several times, but we interviewed him again recently. But a lot of getting into an interview is just watching what they've said before, following up on it, you know, getting them mm -hmm. to expand in a way that you haven't really um, maybe seen them do in the in the past. It kind of makes you raise your level of play, though. Um, I, I played in the NFL with Peyton Manning, and like the last thing I wanted to do was not be prepared in front of that guy because yeah. you knew he was going to be like the most prepared person ever. And so it's like even like as a six year NFL vet, I'm going out there like a rookie, like, oh, my God, I hope Peyton doesn't catch me in something. I don't know what I'm doing here. Same thing with Coach Saban. Like, I want to be prepared because I know what he still does every single day. Like he is there at 3.30 a.m. and he leaves like at, at midnight because that's just who he is. And so, like, if I'm yeah. asking him a question, I don't want to waste a question because he's prepared for everything. But that's kind of the best. 
I think I'm at my best for an interview like that because when you're really prepared and they know that you're prepared, it's a better conversation. And I think right. even if even if you don't see the same eye to eye on certain things or you're pushing them um, for me with like lawmakers and stuff, they I think they like a bit of a challenge. I mean, they're in the public eye for a reason and, and they know that they're going to get pushed on stuff. And they I think they like it better when they know that that you can push them a little. And I think it's a better conversation for people to watch, you know, like you want to be able to watch a really good conversation. You don't want to just watch someone ask easy questions and right. you, it just be like a layup for him. So I, I followed you, you know, and I know your passion for Alabama football and you obviously know sports very well. I read that you, you know, got into journalism after potentially uh, originally being a chemistry major, which sounds awful, but you, yeah. you you end up getting in, you know, get a journalism degree. You go to D.C., which is, uh, again, opposite ends of the whole spectrum from Tuscaloosa, I imagine, and then yeah. uh, get into covering from the entertainment standpoint, the campaign and ultimately into politics with no real political background. Why didn't you choose sports? How was it that you ended up choosing the politics side instead? I always kind of liked politics and I was a chemistry major my freshman year, which was a disaster. And I would have been like the worst pharmacist or scientist ever because it's just not my, uh, not my forte, but, um, which I was telling my little brother's a freshman or a sophomore at Alabama. Now we were talking about this the other day, but, um, but I just always was interested in politics. I did political science as a major, as well as journalism when I was at Alabama, but then I just, started taking journalism classes. I really liked it. I liked reporting and asking questions. And then uh, essentially it transitioned from there where I went to DC totally randomly. And I was doing entertainment because it was the only job that this place had to offer me um, that I worked at the Daily Caller. And so I just needed a job and I took it and um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being in DC. And like the more you're in DC, you kind of get sucked into that political mm -hmm. realm. And then Trump, you know, became the nominee. He was the front runner. No one really expected it. And um, and just covering him, you know, he went to the White House. Typically, you have to have a lot of experience covering politics to be a White House reporter. But Trump kind of threw that out the window because he, he wasn't a normal politician. He wasn't just a conventional, you know, similar White House to, to any of his predecessors. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of the perfect time to start covering politics if, you know, it wasn't like he had 20 years of experience in D.C. He'd never been in D.C. either. And so it, yeah. it just kind of went from there. So would I be wrong in saying that now politics has merged into more the equivalent of sports than ever? I mean, everybody's very passionate and, and, and you know, uh, they, they take their side and, and can't see the other. It seems very similar to what we deal with here in the SEC. I don't know. In the SEC, it might be even more, you know, congenial than it is in Washington. It gets really, I mean, it is kind of amazing. It definitely is a blood sport to a degree um, just to watch, but it is you, people are on their teams. They get entrenched on, on their sides, regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum. And it does seem like fewer and fewer, you know, lawmakers are, are in the middle or crossing over the aisle mm -hmm. like you used to see. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just, it's a fascinating time in American politics and this election will be fascinating as well. We were looking at some polling that CNN put out this morning and, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, it, it does kind of have an analogy in the sense of, you know, a lot of high pressure, high stakes and what that looks like. Yeah. And we all certainly have rivals in the sec. <laughs> One misconception about that though, is like, for me, I went to LSU, but when I was playing Florida was our rival. And a lot of people think maybe it's Ole Miss, maybe it's somebody else. A lot of people, Caitlin, would ask you that question and assume you're going to say Auburn, but it might be a different team. You graduated in 2014. It might be Tennessee. Yeah. It might be LSU. So to Caitlin Collins, who is Alabama's rival? Well, now my enemy is Georgia, just because oh, I'm okay. going, going to the national championship in Indiana and, uh, and losing was just brutal. And to make, you know, put salt in the wound. I came back to work the next day. My dad and I went to the game. We had a great time minus the fact that we lost and we didn't speak on the way home. Um, <laughs> but I came back to work the next day and I'm doing my shift and I go out to do Anderson Cooper's show at eight o'clock mm -hmm. from the white house lawn. And it's like a serious issue. I can't remember what we we're talking about, but for those who are listening, Anderson's executive producer is a huge Georgia fan. Mm -hmm. And he was also at the game seated across from me at the stadium, basically. And so we're, I'm doing my report. Anderson's asking me questions on our reporting. And the third question, he goes, 
Oh, and by the way, um, I heard the tide got rolled yesterday, Caitlin. What can you tell me Oof. about that? And I truly mm. was, <laughs> I could, I thought I was having like an out of body experience. I was like, I cannot believe I'm getting roasted by my own. Wow. Right and the now. producer's control- probably doing the Georgia bark, uh, bark in your yeah. earpiece there, probably because yeah, they like- always bark at you. Yeah, they put the score on the Chiron, like on the lower third of the screen. Wow. It was it was just like, it was brutal. Um, if, I don't know. We hated Tennessee, obviously, gr- um, always growing up. But then, you know, they weren't really an issue for us until last year. And uh, Auburn, my sister did go to Auburn. So we just kind of have like a, we just kind of feel dismissive of Auburn, I think, these days. But um, So was it LSU maybe for you during your time period? I mean, those were certainly some battles. LSU for sure. I mean, it was the, the epic lsu alabama showdown in tuscaloosa that was there when i was there i mean texas a&m beat us when we were like we had some it was we had some really incredible games i tried to go to every single home game when i was there because i knew like this is something that you'll never have again for the rest of your life and even you know at a 20 as a 20 year old i totally appreciated that so I, i think the cool thing about all of us growing up in the south is that you have an allegiance to a team from early on and listening to you talk about your father it sounds like he's always been passionate about alabama football as well so take me back to your childhood memories like it, it, there's always a game when we're kids that stands out about our favorite team was there a, yeah. a moment or a particular game that you remember from your childhood that uh was, was one of the defining moments in your fandom yeah, my dad has the tattoos to prove his uh, loyalty to the Crimson Tide. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's true SEC fandom there. Yeah. He'll be so happy that I that I mentioned that. But um, I remember, so we lived closer to Auburn. So we, my mom was an Auburn fan, so we went to a bunch of Auburn games growing up. But um, they were just kind of fun. But I remember my first game in Tuscaloosa and like walking into Bryant Denny. And, you know, I think one of the first things that I remember, I think I was probably like 10 years old, was how big the players were and like you know you want we watched them obviously every single Saturday but actually going in there and seeing them up close was um was just amazing and then being a student there was this incredible feeling because you're just walking to to class and you see like Mark Ingram which mm-hmm. is like yeah it's just like it's like seeing celebrity it's like being in LA like a regular person seeing a celebrity that was like us on campus in Tuscaloosa and just to see the level of talent that comes through there and like now watching them in the NFL is, is such a fun experience um, growing up. But yeah, we always watch the games every Saturday growing up. Uh, we had football boards. I would help keep the score on those and uh, just go from there. Real quick. Who was your first favorite player that you can remember on the Alabama football team? Oh man, that's, t- I mean, it wasn't even players. Like we just, we loved every, I mean, current players. We just like, we grew up in like, when you grow up in the South, you just grow up steeped in football history mm-hmm. and like yeah. no name it is like someone, you know, like as yeah. a child right. learning about that history is so fun. I'm reading a book right now and it's like the coaching of Bear Bryant and the coaching of Saban and how they've kind of intersected by Lars Anderson. It's such a good book mm-hmm. that looks at the history of the program and the ways it's defined success just over decades. And it really just, it shows you, you know, how much Alabama has meant to people in the state for so long. It does sound like, though, you grew up with those license plates we used to see in the South, like house divided, half <laughs> Alabama, half Auburn. Like, how was that dynamic in the household? I mean, I I love my sister to death, and she went to Auburn, and she <laughs> but... is. But... <laughs> She really, like, my dad threatened to kick her out of the family group chat last season because she just, like, she doesn't even really watch the games that much. Like, she just checks the score, and she'll just, like, chirp in. And for my dad and I, who are emotionally, physically invested in these games, like, it gets, he's like, stop. Like, he he doesn't find it funny at all when right. she's, like, chirping at us. And we're like, Kelsey, just just stop. So we try to, like... We don't, I want to say we exclude her because we love her, but sometimes my dad, my brothers and I, who are all Bama fans, we're like, okay, like you just stay on that side of the house until the game is over and then we'll talk later. (laughs) All right, let's fast forward to present day. Uh, You will not be at Bryant Denny Stadium because you have a bad friend that uh, decided to get married on Saturday. Real questionable in in the South in the fall. Getting but married we, on a Saturday, but it's okay. It's okay. You love I'm that sure friend. You told us before. This. You told us before we came on that you love that friend, and, and, and she's really, going to be happy to be wedding. there. You said yeah, that's it. that's the greatest demonstration of how much she loves the friend. So, um, when you look at this ball game, um, yeah, obviously, you know, not not a huge rival over time, but two historic programs 
Um, what excites you most about getting to watch your team play against the Texas program that will actually be in the SEC next year? Uh, nothing excites me because I'm really nervous about it. And I would hope that it would just, I mean, it just was a lesson in, you know, last year, it's a lesson in humility because last year we were so like, oh, it's Texas will be fine. And then of course we get to the fourth quarter and we're like sweating bullets mm -hmm. and it's like the most stressful day of my life. Um, so I'm approaching it with humility. And um, I don't know. I think Texas is good. I, they didn't look great in their opener to like against Rice. They didn't. I, I think they're going to have some trouble with based on, you know, how Jalen Milrow and everyone looked on, on Saturday as well. Um, but I think that I think that we'll see. I think it'll be a low scoring game. And um, I'm nervous. I'm excited, but I am nervous, but I'm excited. So we'll see. You got to have a soft spot yeah. for Sark, too, though, after what he did for I was your about to say, team. Yeah. I know. And, you know, the history with him and Jalen Milrow is so fascinating because Jalen Milrow obviously initially committed to Texas and then talked to Steve Sarkeesian and was like, OK, well, I'm going to go to Alabama. And now here we are. He's yeah. back mm -hmm. in Texas. Um, so it's pretty funny, actually, to see it, it'll be funny to see him and how he's approaching it, given he grew up rooting for Texas. Um, but they're also coming to Brian Denny. And that's that's a tough game for anyone to play, mm -hmm. you know, Bama in Tuscaloosa. Yeah. And uh, so I'm feeling good about it. I will be live streaming it from the wedding. So I'll be the one sitting in the corner, not on the yeah. dance floor, not talking to anyone, not eating cake, just hanging up by myself. DD, to be fair, if she had a soft spot for every former Nick Saban assistant, That's she would true. have a soft spot for the entire SEC. She already said she hates so. Georgia and Kirby's over and there. And Kirby's the guy, yeah. So. You know, my true soft spot is for Lane Kiffin, though, because I think he is like the funniest person on planet Earth. And he's like one of the football coaches – that I follow on Twitter, who's like actually so comical. And um, so that's actually my true. And, you know, he had like a troubled past and, you know, the Nick Saban like redemption line and all that. It is yeah, the halfway house. That's what we call it. The Nick Saban halfway house. <laughs> yes. The halfway house for assistant college assistant. Yes. Coach. It is if where you, you want to be. If you were a coach, would you be offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator? Oh, I feel like defense. I was an athletic trainer in high school, which means like we'd go out there, we'd tape ankles, hang out on the mm -hmm. sidelines and watch practice. And I was always with like the DBs or the DL. So I don't know. I have like a soft spot for defense. Um, I think so my you favorite, like trash talkers, DBs. I mean, I trash talk like all the time. So yes, <laughs> like that would be, I would be the most obnoxious athlete. If I was actually an athlete, maybe I will be one in my next life. Um, I would be super obnoxious. So but yeah. I good defense the, the best thing you said though and Hess, you know this after you know playing sports after we're used to getting our ankles taped forever like can you go play away from the program like having the skill set to 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 tape somebody's ankle that's a big you know i don't know if you're you know engaged or have a boyfriend but that would be a great selling point that i could tape your ankle but i can you tape too. an ankle exactly yeah <laughs> you know it's funny i haven't done it in like 10 years and we were um when we were in Tuscaloosa, we went and toured their the athletic facilities, which are sick, by the way. Yeah. I, I just would like to come back as an 18-year-old recruit at Alabama. But um, their new uh, sports medicine facility is so nice. And I was just thinking, like, what we, where we were. I went to Prattville High School, which when I was in high school there, we also won the state championship almost every year. So, mm -hmm. like, it was – we came from football success to football success. Um, but yeah, but it was really fun. I haven't used that line like on a dating app or anything yet, but maybe, maybe I'll try that now. I so think you should go in the profile. Actually, I think it should oh, be God. right there on the header. I'm just saying, I mean, that, that is something that former athletes can certainly appreciate. All right. I know we have to get you out of here, but we got to get a prediction. Like we need maybe a score. I know you said low scoring, but do you have a prediction for the game? Give us a winner and give us maybe a score. Okay. Well, obviously my winner is going to be Alabama, but I truly, I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to be what was it last year? 10, nine. I mean, I'm like super, I'm like sweating over what it's going to look like. I don't want to put a number on it because I'm too, <laughs> too um, superstitious. And so you'll I never... just say good guys win. Well, yeah. I mean, fingers crossed, hopefully for my friend's wedding in this, the sake of this reception, Bama wins. All right. Lo lo last thing as it relates to this, you know, I know parts of the country are becoming more accepting of, of legal wagering do you have any sort of wagering um involvement at all when it comes to to games or alabama games specifically i have zero i never bet on the games and here is why because i'm already emotionally dependent on the outcome that if right. i'm also financially dependent i think it would be a bad mix for america <laughs> good choice I think, good great I choice I yeah i don't even want to know what kind of mood i'd be in if it not only did i lose and i'm you know depressed and humiliated but also i'm out you know whatever money 
So I have not made my foray into the into the betting world. Good. Yeah. No. Stay that way. Stay yeah, that way. Stay that way. Certainly <laughs> when it comes to your school, because if you lose, it's a double whammy. You don't mm -hmm. want that situation. Uh, Caitlin, we can't thank you enough for joining us here on pregaming the SEC. We truly appreciate your time. Thank you all for having me and roll tide. All right. We really appreciate Caitlin Collins, CNN, for giving us her time. No surprise. She likes Alabama in that matchup against Texas. Going to be one for the ages. We all look forward to seeing how that plays out. All right. Let's get to the matchup that is blinking up there on the marquee. The one that everybody has been waiting on. Right. Week one. It was Florida State and LSU. Week two. It's Texas at Alabama. And Right now, as we're sitting here, we're doing the podcast. It's about a seven-point spread. I know it's gone up to seven and a half. Some people like to buy a point, maybe. It's gone to six and a half. Let's say it settles at seven. I think that's exactly where this game needs to be. I could see a real push situation here, but I like the spot for Alabama CD. My key is keep doing what you did in week number one. Jalen Milrow, in my opinion, I said it all offseason, was the obvious choice to be your quarterback if no one went and took that job. And they didn't, and that's okay mm -hmm. because they went back to the, hey, let's keep it simple. Let's realize who we have and what we have here. And they've been more physical. They said, we're going to go back to a little bit of a hybrid between old school what we did and the new school with some of the RPO and spread, and it worked perfectly in week number one. I, I Jalen Milrow, even if he's off through the air, you know he has another elite skill set where he can beat you on the ground. And even if he – you know, create space and they roll him out and it's off of RPO action. It doesn't have to be the hardest throw. Like he can do that for you. Like when you have a true dual threat, that's why I call it dual threat. Doesn't mean you have to run for that to yeah. be a threat. It's the fact that you can have the ability to go out there and run that to me, it's a separator in this game. I think him going against that Texas defense, they're going to be so worried about the other weapons because the other weapons in week number one, they showed up. And that was a big question for us. And so if they go all out and sell into Jalen Milrow, stack the box, he can make the throws. If they spread them out, he's the one that's going to hit those Q powers, those Q counters that we know they can go out there and run. So he is the key to success. He unlocks everything for this Alabama offense. For me, I think it's a very close game. I think we're talking – 24-17 feels kind of right in this game. I think Bama's defense makes a play at the end of the game to put it away for Alabama. I like Jay Lamiro to be the key to the game, and I like Alabama to win by seven. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the defense for Alabama because I think that's the thing that we haven't talked about enough this season. And even coming off the game the other day, creating a couple turnovers against Middle Tennessee, I honestly believe that, that Texas's offensive line is going to be the specific key because – you know, Quinn Ewers last year, you know, if he didn't go out with the injury, there's a good chance that they might have ended up beating Alabama. Uh, they've got explosive uh, wide receivers on the outside, and that's what it takes. In order to beat an Alabama team, particularly in Tuscaloosa, you have to have the explosive plays. You're not going to line up and drive the ball right down Alabama's throat. Uh, we don't necessarily know the health of, of some of the players in the secondary for Alabama, which is uh, another thing that we'll have to keep our eye on. But you know, the offensive line for Texas didn't necessarily have a great showing against Rice last week. Uh, this is going to be about five yeah. levels ratcheted up of, yeah. of competition that they'll face. So it, it doesn't matter how good your quarterback is. It doesn't matter how good your receivers are. If you don't have time to throw, if you're giving up penetration in the run game, uh, it's going to be a long afternoon. I think that's the difference. Um, I'm a little more uh, positive about Alabama's chances. I think they win. I think it ends up being by double digits. Uh, a little preview on what we're taking to the bank later in the in the week. But uh, I think this is a game that Alabama shows up for. They live for games like this in Tuscaloosa with everybody, all eyes on them, and, and Texas feeling pretty good about themselves. Nick Saban's record, although you know maybe not great against Kirby Smart in the last couple of meetings, still dominant against former assistants. And uh, I think he'll get the best of Steve, Sar uh, Steve Sarkeesian in this one. All right, before we get to our previews, we want to tell you about Richard Tonda, richardtonda.com. If you're looking for an Odyssey minivan, if you're looking for the Ridgeline truck, if you want a midsize SUV, they've got you covered from every single angle with the pilot, the HRV, the passport, the CRV. If you want it, you name it. They've got it over at Richard's Honda. Find them online again at richardshonda.com, home of the warm and fuzzy feeling. All right. No yofo. That's what we're calling this segment right here. We've got some games. They're at a conference. 
Maybe it's a team that we don't know a whole lot about. We're learning more about by the day. So we're going to go through a list of these games and kind of give you a quick thought on the SEC team and their non-conference opponent. And we have got some road contests. I mean, a majority of these are on the road. And we will start with Vanderbilt at Wake Forest. If you're trying to get to that four for that win total over three and a half, this feels like one that you need from the Commodores. And it's it's not been pretty. It's not been sexy over the first two weeks, but they do have two victories. Wake Forest does not have Sam Hartman. Now they've got a very capable quarterback that filled in for Sam Hartman a year ago. Vanderbilt, you need to go get a win like this. It would do so much for your program. No, I'm excited to uh, see how how uh, Vanderbilt's grown. They got two games under their belt, as you mentioned. Not a uh, not the prettiest of of uh, performances in each, no. but I think in each of those ball games we've identified some guys that are playmakers that are unlike you know what the typical players on the Vanderbilt rosters have been. So I, I, I think you hopefully have enough body of work to understand who you need to make a focal yeah. point of the offense as you, you move forward. Uh, look out for Mitch Griffiths. He is the quarterback that I mentioned. He filled in nicely for Sam Hartman a year ago for Wake Forest. He's got off to a hot start so far this year, throwing for three scores against Elon in the 37 to 17 victory wake forest is a team that is certainly respectable coach clausen is somebody that i respect almost the most in college football vandy going to be a tough one for you go out there though put the neck roll on coach clark lee we know you got it in your office anchor down the whole deal and go get you a victory there because vanderbilt to me man they are right there at the edge of being able to turn around what they are to what they can be but they got to continue to take steps and this would be a leap not just a step all right, All big right. Turp, educate us here. Help us know our foe. Um, yeah, so know like, your foe sounds cooler, but know your foe. Yeah, yeah, know your yeah. foe. Know your foe. Know your foe. Um, yeah, Hester mentioned Griffiths. I mean, he's been there. He's one of the guys we talked about. Rarity in football, man. He's, he's been there for four years. He sat under Sam Hartman. He has played. So he knows that mesh offense well. If, if yeah. you watched the game last year, you will remember that. Um, Wake Forest, they have won their last 13 home games against non-ranked opponents. They have won the first half in each of their last 10 games against non-conference opponents. So they're starting hot. And that's just in general. That's not at home. They've been so what you're saying is to take Wake Forest in the first half? Is that what you're trying to advocate? If you're also looking for action, seven of Wake's last eight September home games against non-ranked opponents have gone yeah. under. So they've started hot and they've gone under for the most part in these early season home games against non-ranked opponents. All right. Hey, all that's great. Doesn't matter. No excuses. Like Joey Hester used to tell me, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. That's what he tell me all the time. We don't care. We don't care about all those stats, Vanderbilt. Anchor down. Let's go. Go get you a dub, okay? I will say this, though. You know, what I take away from some of the stuff that Big Turp mentioned there is that you know, Vanderbilt needs to play a complete 60 minutes. We haven't seen that. We've seen moments against, uh, against uh, Hawaii. We've seen moments against Alabama A&M. They started slow, you know, they, at one point the score was five to three. I thought we were watching, you know, the Vandy boys on the baseball yeah. diamond, but I think we, you know, it's time to put a full four quarters together and um, you know, see how the, the, the chips fall there at Wake Forest. Uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit here on our week two previews. I'm going to go a little bit out of order because I want to spend a little bit of time on this game. And that is Ole Miss traveling to take on the two lane green wave. The only ranked on ranked matchup I believe that we have here in week number two. And it is a unique game. Ole Miss a lot of times wouldn't travel to a two lane. Two lane, by the way, has earned the right to have this be a home game for them. They beat the Big 12 champion in Kansas State a year ago. They beat the Heisman Trophy winner in a team that was a game away from being in the college football playoff in USC a year ago. And they have the opportunity to go be the standard of the group of five. Yeah. They're the, they're the 2020 version of the yes. giant killer, right? I mean, we watched it before our own eyes. You mentioned it earlier when we did some radio together. Boise was a team that kind of came out yep. of nowhere and had that title. Cincinnati became that team and made it to the, the college football playoffs. So uh, I think we're watching Tulane, and this is a, a game that if, if Ole Miss isn't careful, they – they're gonna oh, not even it. hey, not even look. I'm I'm gonna call my shot. Like not even careful. Like you better bring it. There's I, no I've, question. I, I've seen Tulane play too many times, and Michael Pratt, their quarterback, plays like he's a fullback out there. Yeah. 
He's got but, no regard for his body. Go I'll watch say, the Oklahoma game two years ago. Like, no, Ole Miss better bring – and Ole Miss can. Ole Miss, I think, is a damn good football team, but so is Tulane. But I, I think the comments from Lane Kiffin and the way that he's framed this game, calling it an SEC game, like Tulane is legitimately – I know they were in the SEC. I know they were an original member, but they have the makings – of being one of those teams that would be right in the middle of the, the SEC this year. And so um, it's a great litmus test for where you are. We too, last week was not watching Ole Miss's offense was a lot of fun watching Jackson Dart and his understanding of the offense and his improvement with his footwork and accuracy was nice. Watching Trey Harris catch four touchdowns was nice, but let's see as the, the competition ramps up about three levels this week against Tulane, how you look. So South Alabama returned the, Fourth most production of any team in college football, 10 and three last year, beat some really good teams, lost to some really good teams right there at the buzzer on the road. Kane Wilmack is a star in the making. He will be a coach in the Power Five here in the near future. And Tulane had them come into their house and Tulane beat up on them 37 to 17. Michael Pratt missed one pass attempt mm -hmm. in the game. So I'm just saying, like Ole Miss fans, and you already know this, you hope your players know this. I, I've been in this game before. Where you play a team and your coach is like, hey, be careful, be careful. I'm like, okay, look, I'm going to eye roll this, whatever. And then all of a sudden you're in the, a battle in the fourth quarter. You better be ready because Tulane has the Jimmys and Joes. They've got Willie Fritz. They've got Cam Wire starting at tackle who started for LSU. They got Jared Small starting at linebacker who started for LSU. They've got guys that can go out there and win this game. If you're Ole Miss, don't do too much. Do what you do run the football, dare them to try to get in your way and go out there and get a victory. Because if you play your game and you don't play outside of your body, you'll get a victory. If you I, try to do too much or not enough, Tulane can beat you. I would love to know when this game was scheduled, right? You, you make schedules well in advance. This is uh, Tulane could not have been, you know, at the level they were are now when they scheduled oh, it. I mean, now they know? won. They won what two games two years ago? Willie Fritz. I yeah. mean, completely. I mean, now that see, but that was a hurricane season. And yeah. if you've never been through that, that is brutal. A team that got displaced multiple times, and your team's all over the place. And I am going to give Willie Fritz a pass on that season because outside of that, it's been a lot of good there in New Orleans for uh, for Coach Fritz. No doubt about it. So uh, excited to see where Ole Miss actually is, and uh, hopefully. You know, it's a, I, I would say that this week two is better nationally than week one was. And this is certainly one of the games I think that is helping to make that, that, uh, that schedule look better. I don't know if a lot of people nationally understand it, but at least in the South and the, and the dynamics, big turf Tulane is actually a much, it's an older rival than Alabama is for Ole Miss. They played Tulane before they played Alabama. So this this got a lot of history to it. And I know the Ole Miss faithful are looking forward to getting New Orleans again. Whoever signed off on leaving the SEC is <laughs> public enemy number one in Tulane. I mean, it has to be. But just real quick on them, since Willie Fritz took over in 2016, eight and five against the spread as a home underdog, which they are on Saturday. Uh, and then Tulane just straight up 11 and two against the spread last season. Yeah. Uh, and you know what they say good teams win great teams cover Ole Miss last yeah. season as a single digit favorite oh five and one against the spread mm. okay I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see what that that means I guess in games where they're supposed to be evenly matched they underperform right is that what the the illustration of those numbers mean it's not I me mean, it sounds like it to me I mean look words lie numbers don't I was always yeah. taught that so We'll see how it plays out. It's a fascinating game. It's about 50 minutes down the road from me, and my 13-year-old son is deciding which game to take some of his buddies to. This game or LSU Grambling, and I wouldn't hate if you picked Tulane Ole Miss. Hold on, hold on. You got you got Tulane tickets already? I mean, I can get them. I mean, our, look, I'm, I'm on the radio in New Orleans. I can, hey, favor here, favor there. Hey, right. uh, shout out to Miss Susan Fritz, Coach Willie Fritz's wife, who is a loyal listener to Off Campus, by the way. She's a P1. Nice. Okay. I'm going to try to use every relationship I can. I, hey, I feel you, man. You got to use – Here, here's the thing. Always remember this. In business, your network is your net worth. All right? You're only as good yep. as your network. All right? Hey, I, okay. I'll take that to the – it's like you own a mortgage company or something. <laughs> it's like you've used that before. All right, let's get to this game. Auburn at Cal. Cal put up like almost 700 yards of offense. I don't really know what to make of them. It was against North Texas. Saw some good things from Auburn. 
They're traveling across the country. It's never uh, won in the state of California, by the no, way. No, I mean they probably haven't played there a ton, but it's less than a touchdown spread. I don't I don't know how to feel about this game. Uh, you know, Wilcox out there at Cal thinks a pretty good football coach. I just don't think he's had the Jimmys and Joes to be able to go out there and compete. It's an interesting game because of what Cal did in week number one against North Texas. It's a long travel situation for Auburn. We still don't really know who they are. I like them in this matchup, but I can see it going sideways if you're not careful. Yeah, I, I thought my major takeaway from Auburn in week one was the usage of the quarterbacks. Uh, Hugh Freeze warned us that they'd have a package for Robbie Ashford. Uh, little did we know, you know, he we'd have the opportunity to coin the name Red Zone Robbie as he came in and scored three <laughs> touchdowns down in that part of the field. Uh, Peyton Thorne, I thought, threw the ball really well. And maybe the most um, – pleasing thing to me was the receivers because that was a real liability when I was there in the spring. Um, you know, I thought Shane hooks, the transfer from, from Jackson state played well. Uh, Jay fair caught a touchdown and uh, like five, six passes on the day. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I thought as a whole, that group represented pretty well. And so I, um, I'm feeling better about Auburn. And I think a lot of it had to do with the, um, you know, the, the way that they were able to win so decisively. I didn't I didn't necessarily know if I could trust them to win as decisively as they did on Saturday. So this would be a nice win for Hugh Freeze and company going across the country, beating a future ACC opponent in Cal Berkeley. So we'll see if they can get it done. Yeah, so what do you know about uh, Jaden Ott? He's, uh, just in, in reading about him, he seems like your type of back. He's like six, two, six foot, 200. Dude, dude, like 1,200 all-purpose yards last year as a true freshman and 11 touchdowns. He went for 188 yeah. last week and two scores. He, he just seems like a big, dominant runner. And then Auburn gave up 5.3 on the ground for Perry to UMass last week. So, I mean, this dude could go off a little bit. So, that is true. It's going to be a fascinating matchup. Now, you're wondering what the offensive line can do as far as opening up some running lanes for them. But we saw... Auburn at times last year, or last week, I should say, last year too, if we're, if we're really being honest with ourselves, but last week kind of give up some of those running lanes. It, it can be a guy that can take over the game. And then uh, um, they, they also have Isaiah Afonz. I saw him, he, Montana State, all-time leading rusher. He's a fifth-year guy. He had 3,700 that, yards over there, He and he punched in yes, three scores last week. So that's that's the guy. That's the guy that can will I? punch you right in the mouth. And so I, this, is, this is not just roll the Auburn logo helmet out there and win this game. It's not like I don't know what Cal can be against that, but like when you turn on the tape and, and you see a guy like you're talking about, like he's done it at a different level, but I know who he is. I know what the identity is. And so, and their head coach kind of has that identity. He wants Cal to be that. They haven't been that, certainly not for a, a full season, but it, like who scheduled these games? Who's, yeah. who's who, 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 what, all these, all, Auburn at Cal, Ole Miss at Tulane, Vanderbilt at Wake Forest. That one makes a little bit more sense. Texas A&M at Miami was a home and home. Okay, like yeah, that one big brands. Like I kind of get that, but there's some there's some conference games on the road that we don't see very often. Yeah, that could get kind of hairy kind of quick. Another one of those matchups that we're not used to seeing is a little SEC Pac-12 matchup. Well, Pac-12 matchup for now, soon to be a SEC Big 12 matchup in the future. Arizona at Mississippi State. Mississippi State CD, nice little win against a. Good FCS opponent, Southeastern Louisiana. But look, Jet Fish has that team, Arizona, playing a, a little bit different than they have in years past. So this is one of those spots. If you're Mississippi State, you've got to be careful because what do you have next week? You have LSU coming to town. You start SEC play. So you've got to make sure you take care of business against the team. SEC fans, listen up. Arizona is good enough to beat Mississippi State if you overlook them. So, again, not a matchup that we see a lot of. It's one of those interesting matchups with a team coming over from the Pac-12 to SEC country. And I liked what I saw week number one on both sides of the football from Mississippi State. But Arizona had a nice week one as well. Yeah, I think the uh, thing we were all looking for in the offseason was what was the new offense going to look like without – you know, Coach yeah. Leach there with Kevin Barbe being added as the new offensive coordinator. What elements of of uh, offense would we see that we haven't seen before? Some of that was used the um, the motion across the formation from uh, um, Creed Whittemore uh, ended yep. up creating some issues in coverage, and and uh, the wheel route he caught down the sideline was as a result of that. Some different 
formations, obviously the emphasis on being a little more physical in terms of the downhill run game. I think, you know, by the end of the year, we may look up and see Woody Marks as perhaps the most valuable player on this offense. And um, that's not taking anything away from, from uh, Will Rogers or, or even uh, Mike Wright and what he does, but uh, they are, intent on being a downhill physical run team and uh at least one weekend mississippi state you look at the stats they're number one in the sec as it comes yep. to rushing I, who would have thought that we would have been saying that if we were uh projecting uh a couple years back uh where they are now yeah obviously the competition goes up a level here against arizona going from an fcs opponent a good southland conference opponent in southeastern louisiana but yeah it's going to go up a notch we'll see if they can get it done how about this stat from big turp arizona has not beaten an sec opponent since 1976 and they are zero and three against sec foes this century i can tell you a quick story before we move on i was a part of one of those losses for arizona i think it was 2006 they come to Baton Rouge and pregame warmups told the story of the game. We had like 25 minutes left on the clock for pregame warmups. Usually you take that down to about eight to 10 minutes. They were so tired. It was September in Baton Rouge. The humidity and the heat got to Arizona so much CD. They took it in early. They quit on pregame warmups. And we knew at that moment, <laughs> oh, we've got you. There's nothing you can do in this game against us. This game going to be in Starkville. I don't know the weather, but I'm sure it's going to be hotter than hot in Starkville, Mississippi uh, here coming up on Saturday. So that's always an advantage for an SEC school. And look, new offense, maybe they can lean on Arizona a little bit. Yeah, forget about the heat. It's the humidity that gets the folks from the desert. You know, we always talk about, ah, it's 115, but it's a dry heat. Yeah, it, it's a different <laughs> sort of feeling when you step into the wet blanket that is the humidity here in the South. So, yeah, I think that'll definitely be a factor as well. But I'm, I'm intrigued overall. I mean, we got a couple good SEC versus Pac-12 matchups and after the week that the pac 12 had out there going 13 and 0 in week one yeah uh, i think it's got everybody's attention a little bit more i think um you know whether we're talking about auburn's trip to to cal or whether we're talking about arizona coming to starkville those two teams probably have a little more respect than maybe they would have otherwise because of what the conference yeah. did and, and the fact that they won uh the way that they did individually yeah, to look from their perspective, what a great opportunity. Certainly if you're Cal hosting an SEC school after what you did in week one, you've got a chance now to really put some real juice and life into your program. Same thing for Arizona. They come across the country, go against a team that won nine games last year that's got some real juice this year. It's an opportunity for those schools, and the SEC teams need to be put on notice, and I think they were last week after the Pac-12 went undefeated, like you mentioned, C.D., Big Turp, anything else we need to know about the uh, the 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 Pac-12 foe in Arizona? Yeah, so just real quick. No yo foe. No yo foe. No yo foe, exactly. That's why we're doing this. Um, quarterback Jaden Delora in his first season in Tucson last year, 3,685 yards. That was good for third most ever in Arizona history. Yeah. He had 25 touchdowns last year, too. And apparently he put on 25 pounds this offseason. So, I mean, just somebody to watch out for on Arizona. Um, and then if you're into this sort of thing, Arizona – in their last 10 games as an underdog of at least seven points, one and nine overall, and they're three and seven against the spread in those games. And then on the other side, Mississippi State, if they are a favorite of a touchdown or more in their last 10 games, they're eight and two straight up and they're five and five against the spread. So trends wow. against the spread in Mississippi State's favor here as a touchdown of seven or more. Are we thinking uh, potential best bet here? I don't want to tip the hand too early. Well, but the, your boy was... needs a little juice in his best bet because well, we'll it was over. Later. It, don't, don't, was, don't, it, it was over. Okay. Well, no, so maybe, we need to revisit tease that. action CD, tease that thing down to like one ish. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, don't know. I like it. All right. How about this? Let's uh, let's get to the pressure packed bowl. That's what I'm calling this game. Texas A&M at Miami. Pressure all over the place because you need to win this game if you're both program. All right, both of these programs are trying to get to the next level. Now, Texas A&M, highly disappointing last year. Nice week one win against New Mexico. Miami was not where we had them last year, and they had a nice week one win in the Battle of Miami. Where can these teams go? Can these teams make any noise in the SEC and the ACC? It feels like Texas A&M is closer to achieving that than Miami is. 
Mario Cristobal has a lot of pressure, just like Jimbo Fisher does. This is a game last year that was ugly as hell. There's no other way to describe this game. It was just bad ball. It was across the board. What can Texas A&M do offensively in this yeah. game? Last week, they had what? They had better athletes. They had one-on-one -on -one coverage, and, and Connor Wegman went out there and said, you know what? Hey, I'm just going to throw it up. Stewart, go get it. And you can do that. Miami's going to have different DBs than New Mexico did. So can you have that same approach? I liked it last week. What can be your changeup if you're Bobby Petrino coming up against a more athletic, more talented team in Miami? I don't like how you keep describing that. You know, Connor Wegman, you know, I, I think he... It's we, what it was. But I mean, but it, it, it like, okay, I like it, but it's that's what it was. Like, go no, look at the touchdowns they've made. But, you know, I, I thought, you know, some of those fade balls they threw, you know, they ran some slot fades that I thought were were well executed and, and um, you know, playing You can to still the, be well executed, but give your guy a chance. I like giving your guy a chance. LSU didn't do that. LSU's yeah. quarterback didn't give his guy a chance. It's yeah. a skill set, but that's what they did. They took their one-on-one -on -one matchup and said, my receiver's better yeah. than your DB, which is okay. I, I, I think the things that I focus on in this game, offensive line play, I thought both Miami and Texas A&M's offensive lines were better than they were last year. Um, now, obviously, you know, overmatched opponents in each of those cases, but you go back and watch, you know, Miami's offensive line was incredibly physical up front able to to get a significant push in in the run game. Texas A&M I thought really was solid in pass protection and uh I thought Connor Wigman did a, a good job of understanding when he was protected and when he wasn't. In instances where they brought more than than Texas A&M's offensive line could protect, he faded a little bit, gained a little uh, you know, time by by working away from the the free rusher and and did throw the ball in a position to where his guy could go get it particularly down in the red zone. So uh, I think that was one of the other things that stood out to me was offensive line play of both of those teams in week one. Yeah, and when you look at the offensive line play for Miami, they've got obviously an Alabama transfer. They've got five-star freshmen out there starting. And I'll be honest with you, I like this. I like this new trend in college football. Like, let's don't just sit this guy because we're we're worried maybe he's not going to be ready. Baptism by fire. Yeah. If you feel like that five-star guy can go out there, we saw it last year with Will Campbell and Emory Jones at LSU. If you feel like the five-star guy can go out there and give you the best chance to win, why wait? Why hold him back? And so that's the approach that Miami's had. They got a really nice recruiting class last year, and we've already seen a bulk of those guys not only play, but they're out there in the first 22. Yeah, both those guys last year um, got significantly better as the season went on. So not only – was LSU's offensive line in better shape because they they made the switch to the more talented guys with more potential. But the experience they gained last year is certainly going to pay dividends for them this year and beyond. So I, I'm with you on that. I like the the idea. Let's just put our best player yeah. in there. Even if we have some some bumps in the, in the growing pain department, it, it's well worth it for the return now and in the long term. All right, so let's talk about this one. Let me Let me throw this to you in this matchup. Which team has more pressure to win this game? Yeah. Because we know the narrative. If Miami loses it, it's just more of the same. Mario Cristobal left a great situation at Oregon to come down to Miami, what was home, and he's going to turn the program around. And they've done a nice job in recruiting. It has not translated to the field. For Texas A&M, you want to be one of the big boys. It can't just be the 9-1 and one COVID season. You've got to show me more. Last year was embarrassing to what their standard was. They're trying to get back to be in the conversation with Alabama, with Georgia, with LSU, with Tennessee, with the other top teams in the SEC. And if they lose a game like this against an ACC school yeah. that nobody has real high expectations for, you're almost hitting start over reset button after what you did in week one. I think it's big not only for Texas A&M, but it's big for the conference as a whole. For the SEC to go one and two in the first weekend against ACC opponents, uh, the reputation of the league, I think, is on the line. So you asked me in terms of who's under more pressure between you know these two programs. I, I think it's got to be A&M because Jimbo Fisher's been there longer than what Mario Cristobal's yeah. been in Coral Gables. Uh, they have not got the return on investment that you know I think a lot of fans thought they would have by now. Not even uh, an appearance in the SEC championship game, let alone you know any titles to claim. So uh, I think that's that's probably you know one of the big factors. And and honestly, this is kind of a do or die year for for Jimbo Fisher. You bring in Bobby Petrino, maybe your last line of insulation before you know the mob starts coming for you. Oh, so yeah. I, I think this is a game that they got to not only you know, win, but they, they need to do it in a manner that shows that they are 
making strides in the development of of you know both sides of the ball and the program as a whole. Yeah, and when you make changes like they did this offseason in College Station, you realize what it is. I've been a part of NFL teams, right? You're you're not awful. You're not falling off a cliff, but it's just not getting to that level that you think it should be. So you make wholesale changes during the offseason. Yeah. Coaching staff, GM, players, personnel, whatever it might be in the NFL level. Well, same thing here. Like you realize where you were and you had to make a big move, a bold move, one that could really go either way. So far, one game sample size, it's been good for them. But if they lose this game, it, it is going to be just what we saw on on Twitter after LSU lost and Brian Kelly, what we saw from Dabo Sweeney and Clemson on Twitter after they lost. It's going to be like that, maybe even two folds. Because people are just waiting for the Jimbo Fisher, Bobby Petrino thing yeah. to not work. Yeah. All right. So if you're a uh, Texas A&M fan, Big Turp, it's time to help uh, know your foe. What do you got for us? Um, so this is just real quick on Miami as a program, not specifically this year, but just two numbers that jumped out to me that's crazy when thinking about Miami. They have Cameron Kitchens, the safety, returning yeah. All-American. He's Miami's first returning All-American in general since 2006 wow that's 17 years since they've had a returning all-american so watch out for cameron kitchens in that uh secondary for yeah. miami and then the other one is that they've only had one 10 win season since 2003 yeah, yeah. i mean we know that they were five and seven last year five and seven a and m five and seven was uh, miami both trying to get back to where they should be where people think they should be especially given all the resources poured in but yeah one 10 win season in the last 20 for Miami. And then just to rehash what Hester was saying before about the youth on this team, they led the ACC last week in true freshman snaps. They had 15 true freshmen see action on uh, Friday night in week one. And that was led by Francis Maui Goa. Uh, if I said that wrong, I'm sorry, but <laughs> a right tackle 61 snaps. Yep. Uh, PFF credited him with not allowing a single sack. Texas A&M has more dudes than Miami of Ohio. That's what I'm hearing. We'll see if he stands up in uh, week two as well. But, I mean, true freshman offensive lineman, right tackle, cornerback, running back, wide receiver, D-line, DN quarterback. I mean, they have young dudes everywhere. So that'll be fun to watch. And then just real quick, they each had six explosive plays of 20 or more yards last week in their week yeah. one matchups against lesser opponents. So we'll see if either team can carry over that success against a bigger defense in week two. All right, before we get to the results of take it to the bank, although I don't know if we want to do that here. It's, look, we didn't have any tape. Now we got tape. We'll be better. CD, you got a chance to catch up with Nick Saban this week. And I know we talked to Texas and Alabama earlier on in the show. When you talked to him earlier, did you get a feel of how maybe he was feeling about this matchup? I, I don't know if you uh, had a chance to hear, but I I, I brought up to him – you know, some of the concerns I had talked about as it related to running backs and pass protection. I said, you know, they, they, they didn't use great technique and sometimes it didn't look like they knew their assignments. And he kind of debated me on that said, I don't know where you got that from. They knew who they were blocking. They just didn't execute it quite as well. So I, you know how I feel about, you know, I don't want to cross coach Saban ever, <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, it is a, a concern. And one of the things, you know, you get from, from Coach Saban are very well thought out answers as it relates to yeah. you know where his his team is right now, the things that that he likes, the things that he doesn't like, and and you know we ask him about you know what you can take away from last year, and he's really not focused at all about you know going back and looking. But I think one of the things that they need to be aware of is is how much Texas blitzed them last year, and that was blitzing mm -hmm. Bryce Young. I know it's a little different you know type of skill set that Jalen Milrow has, but blitzing is something that Texas's defense typically does quite a bit of and watching on tape the susceptibility of the the running back in protection definitely leads me to believe that you'll see a lot of that early in the game all right last one before we close out our week two preview when you talked to him was it over the phone or was it like a zoom situation where you no, could see him? no zoom it was over the phone okay okay Wait. because when you asked him that question i could have given you his exact body language of how he sat up in his chair and how he adjusted himself before he answered it so i'm glad you didn't see that it's it, it is a a body posture that i have seen many a times playing for coach saban so it, 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 I thought, you know, because it was interesting. He went back and and uh, uh, our producer on the show found some sound after the game where, you know, Coach Saban mentioned he was disappointed in the running backs in protection 
Um, but I don't think he liked hearing it from somebody else. You know, I think that's what it was. <laughs> that's that, right. Now I'm not trying to, to a, act like I know the ins and outs of the team, but what I saw on tape was something that, mm-hmm. that was a little concerning to me. So he definitely was defensive of his players, which I certainly respect. Um, but I, I, I do think that anybody that's gone back and watched the tape sees the same things that I do is that they've got to be more so- solid in the, in the pass protection. You know what my theory is? My theory is he has a burner account and he follows pre-gaming the SEC and he mm-hmm. saw you throw out Middle Tennessee State plus 39 last week. <laughs> you think he's mad I think about I just that? Took, I think I took the under because typically they don't beat up on teams. Yeah. They get to a point where it's comfortable and they kind of just take their foot off the gas pedal. Well, they didn't do that against Middle Tennessee. No, they, and, uh, I was the under king last week. I will not be that again. They covered that 52 and a half themselves. Has, has got burned because mm-hmm. he took Alabama MTSU under 52 and a half. Alabama covered that themselves. He took mm-hmm. Texas A&M, New Mexico under 49 and a half. Texas A&M covered that themselves. But I, I don't blame Why you. Why are you bringing like, up all stuff, Big Turk? But the, but, like in your defense, <laughs> historically, those teams yes. have not shown the propensity to do that. And I think that's one of the best things I took away from Texas A&M was that, hey, they've slopped it around quite a bit with inferior yeah. opponents over the last couple of seasons, particularly in an opening games. This one, they went out and handled their business, yeah. irregardless of who's on the other side of the, the, the field. Yep. All right, there is our week two preview. The games on the movie posters, Vanderbilt at Wake Forest, Auburn at Cal, Arizona at Mississippi State, and the games up on the marquee, Ole Miss at Tulane, Texas A&M at Miami, and Texas at Alabama. I love the slate that we have. But as we finish out every single pre-gaming the SEC, unfortunately, we have to take it to the bank. All right, we just heard about some of the unfortunate under results because Alabama and AM decided to go off in week one. So Hester missed on those two unders and also unfortunately missed on South Carolina. Is that your two. first I, I, that, that feels Saturday? like my first one. Yeah, like, I, don't I was think on happened. a heater last year, and oh hey, my goodness. The great part about that is you can only go up from here, right? And, and you, get the, you get the dud out of the way now, and we know these teams a little bit more. It's tough in week one. We're projecting off what we think we know, what we knew last year, what they're hearing from the coaches and players. Yeah, I think with exactly. a week under our belts, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're my yeah. guy, dude. I'm always yeah. going to defend you. I know yeah. you know what you're doing when it comes yeah. to handicapping yeah. these games. Three and no week this week. Bookie. Let's go. Three well, I mean, and no there, week. And there was one single ticket we, we could take to the window, and that was Tennessee, Virginia, over 56. Cash it during <laughs> during starts one and oh, and then unfortunately, mm-hmm. MTSU plus 39 did not hit. And then the decisive swing game was the Monday night or Sunday night. I just keep forgetting these days. LSU minus two, yeah, and that did not hit. So CD one and two, Hess, oh, yeah. three, but nowhere to go. Okay. But hey, we don't need to recap all that. Yeah. We've already done that here today. We don't need to recap what happened on Sunday night or on Thursday night last week. This week's a new week, okay? Start we said fresh. it to start this podcast. We are not singing Simon and Garfunkel, all right? We are not sad. We were glad to have the opportunity to watch some football, and we're glad again this week, CD. No doubt, no doubt. We'll be, uh, what do we typically do, Big Turp? We get our uh, best bets out there sometime Friday, I think, right? Isn't that the plan? We say Friday, and then we say or Saturday, and then without fail, it's Saturday morning. So It's, just- like, it, it's like our depth chart. It could be Friday, or it could be Saturday. You just got to, you That's know, fair. watch and see. At least you're very, not you freeze. We released a depth chart this week. We, we I, I threw out <laughs> best bets. Actually, that might have been the move after last yeah. week. I yeah. best bets. Where'd you week. get that from, bro? Huh? <laughs> All right, we appreciate you tuning in and listening. We appreciate Caitlin Collins for joining us here on Pre-Gaming the SEC. Best of luck coming up to your favorite SEC squad this week. We appreciate Blue Delta Jeans, bluedeltajeans.com, and always go see Richard's Honda over at richardshonda.com. We will see you next week. I like to say the same time, the same place. We're pretty good about it, but I know we'll have an episode, and you'll see it when it when I guess you see it, okay?